move on to our next speaker, uh, Paolo Sacchet, who is a very versatile book historian. He's worked on uh, the use of printing uh, by governments in early modern Europe, on uh, the textual scholarship of classical editions, and also on the history of collecting. And his subject this afternoon really links, in a very interesting way, I think, book production and the history of collecting and tries to explore uh, the ground in between, uh, the overlapping, the ground where those two uh, topics overlap. Thank you. Thank you, Giles, and uh, thanks to the conveners for inviting me to attend this uh, very insightful conference. Just a minute. There are also plans. <coughs> so, um, this paper aims to provide a new insight into the 16th century practice of printing books on blue paper. In particular, I will attempt to show how the use of a rather neglected category of sources, antiquarian sale catalogues issued by auctioneers and booksellers, is crucial to retrace extant copies and establish their provenance over time. Ever-growing attention has been paid in recent years to the financial and commercial features of the early modern book trade through the analysis of book material evidence, inventories, stock and advertising lists of booksellers and publishers. By contrast, catalogues of historical, modern and contemporary antiquarian dealers have ceased to be systematically employed since mid 20th century and the value of the material they contain remains underestimated. This appears to be due to four main factors. The persistent influence of textual bibliography over other methodologies, including copy-specific and object-driven approaches. The relatively limited interest within the field of book studies in the history of collecting. The general disregard for the economic dimension of book production and commerce the practical difficulty of finding large and fairly consistent collections of sale catalogues, which are frequently either scattered among several libraries and sometimes unsystematically stored, or still in the possession of the firms which issued them. Over the time, these factors have created a gap in bibliographical scholarship, even in those countries relying on a solid tradition of studies in private collecting, such as the UK. I hardly need to mention the pioneering work of Graham Pollard, Tim Mumby, David Pearson, and Robin Alston on the subject. The importance of sale catalogues as source of information becomes pivotal in relation to traditional categ categories of collectible items. Among these, early books printed on unusual support have always played a major role in the antiquarian trade on account of their rarity and their association with famous Renaissance printers. Most notably, it was Aldous Manutius who improved the early commercial strategy of deluxe print runs on parchment and came up with the idea of printing on royal size paper and blue paper. Our knowledge of the latter practice, however, relies on conventional wisdom, built on a very partial data. Integrating the reference in antiquarian sale catalogues with the record of private and institutional libraries and of bibliographical repertoires is proving a very fruitful way to dig out several new specimens and reconstruct their afterlife on and off the market. This is enabling me to draw the first comprehensive census of lost and survived copies and challenge many of the present assumptions. Before focusing on methodology, allow me to introduce you to the early modern blue paper. It is a cheap, rather poor quality paper, resulting from an insufficiently white pulp which was dyed to obtain an even and relatively bright surface. Plants. At the time, the corollant was indigo, 
extracted from woad or guado in Italian, or the more exotic indigo plant, mostly from India. Already quite common in the 16th century, but not as much as wood, wood which was a, um, um, an autochthonous plant in Europe. First recorded in the West in 1389, blue paper started to be employed as a drawing support only a century later, when Italian, especially Venetian artists, looked for a triple color effect in their sketches. Like in this portrait by Carpaccio, which is now in the British Museum. Literature on the topic is scarce and patchy. It consists chiefly on material analysis and broad historical overviews penned by German paper scholars, such as Wieser Weiss and, more recently, Irene Brückler. The catalogues of two exhibitions mounted in Marseille in the 1970s and some 20 years later here in the British Library did shed new light on a very specific side of the issue concerning Hebrew religious books. This category of blue paper books fall outside the purpose of my investigation, primarily because of its intrinsic meaning. For blue, the biblical word tekelet, is the color is a uh, color of God's glory used even today in sacred vessel and vestments, like in Israel flag, for instance. These copies were also likely to have a restricted circulation, limited to Jewish community and, in the best case scenario, a handful of Christian Hebraists. George Fletcher added some important pieces of evidence in relation to Aldine publications, analyzing three copies held in the Perpont Morgan Library but he also ventured on a quite fanciful classification of the colors of blue paper. 16th century books printed on blue paper have sometimes been regarded as donation copies, not meant for sale. But such an assumption relies on no solid evidence. In the absence of an exhaustive investigation, we are in the dark about temporal and spatial coordinates of this enigmatic phenomenon. Likewise, the number of surviving copies is still unknown. Though references is usually made to their utmost rarity and occasionally to the UCLA collection featuring the striking number of 21 items. Well, the census I've been conducting unveils a very different picture in which figures are 11 times higher than that and consistency is impressive in terms of printing location and years of the over 250 recorded copies. 98% of them are copies of Italian editions, most published in Venice, but from the 1530s onwards, also in Rome, Florence, Naples, and other small towns in the northern and central areas of the peninsula. Although all genres appear in the list, including ephemera, religious, scientific, and illustrated books, a large portion consists of classics and contemporary literature, with Petrarch and Ariosto having the lion's share, while the most represented printer is, by far, Gabriele Giolito, followed by the Aldine Press. Furthermore, provisional data show that most of them were conceived as sa saleable objects, consciously crafted by publishers for expanding the audience of early modern collectors and cutting costs of deluxe printing, embracing extravagancy over quality. This appears to be true since the very beginning. From the early day of his business, Aldous satisfied his most demanding customers by occasionally printing on parchment a few copies of an edition in line with the manuscript and incunabula tradition. This first volume of Aristotle's Corpus, date is dated 1495, may well be the first example of an Aldine book on such a prestigious support. It is a copy now held at the Escorial, close to Madrid, and it was specially made for Aldus's former pupil and main patron, Alberto Pio, Prince of Carpi. By printing on parchment, it was possible to achieve admirable and lasting results though it also meant that the printer had first to shoulder the high material cost of the high material cost. No mistaken was allowed um, under the press, 
as discarding leads would add up to expenses, though the Aldine press did not usually have to worry about irreparable misprinting. Initially, these parchment copies were prepared on commission, but it seems likely that thanks to the rapid growth and stabilization of a collecting market for Aldine books, the firm soon began to produce them without preliminary agreements with prospective purchasers, in the certainty that many would come forward to buy in any case. Renoir, the standard bibliographer for Aldine um, books, and more recently Helena Sepe, counted about a hundred surviving parchment copies for the whole output of the press, mostly octave editions of the early, of the early Cinquecento. So far, Aldous's strategy towards collectors does not show significantly new elements, except for his unusual charisma and the extensive network of social and scholarly relationship he succeeded in building up. However, something changed in the last two years of his life, when he began to experiment with color and size of paper, creating new categories of collectible books, the production of which was continued by the Torresanis, his heir, as well as by Paolo Enaldo the Younger, his direct heir. In the space of a few months, during the years 1514, some Aldine copies printed on blue paper and unusually large white paper, the so-called carta grande or reale, popped up on the market. The first Aldine books on blue paper were two copies of the Scriptores Rei Rustiche in quarto, dated May 1514. Here on display, we have the only existing copy entirely printed on this unusual support. One of his early owners had it illuminated with red initials of a bibliographic taste, further emphasizing the chromatic contrast between blank and printed areas. The book was donated to the Pierre von Morgan Library by the bibliographer Kurt Buhler. It should be the same copy by Count, um, owned by Count Gaetano Melzi, um, obtained in Zurich, as recorded by Renoir who also mentioned a second defective copy, which belonged to the Remondini family of Bassano, and is now held at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. The use of royal size paper, not for the whole print run of an edition, but only for a tiny portion of it, occurred consistently from September 1514, beginning with the octave edition of San Azaro Arcadia. This is a later example a copy of the 1533 Cicero Epistles signed and annotated by the scholar Benedetto Ramberti, now in the British Library. You may notice the distinctive layout and the oblong shape once outer margins are trimmed. The circumstances of this material innovation remains largely unclear. While the Aldine books on Carta Leale have been the object of interest of Cono Fai, the late object of interest, much remains to be done on the use of blue paper. Nevertheless, the purpose behind the use of both types of paper seems very clear. Greatly reducing the material cost of the lax copies, while at the same time expanding the range of possibility for collectors, probably in connection with different pricing. This seems to be confirmed by the fact that special copies already of the 1514 edition of San Azzaro were available on parchment, blue paper, and royal size paper. The history of blue paper printing after Aldous is something which the data gather, gathered through my senses will eventually help to elucidate. For the time being, the main research problem is retrieving copies. I've been implementing three different strategies to tackle this issue. The first, and most obvious, is interrogating the online catalogues of the many libraries spread uh, throughout the world, um, holding early printed books, using truncation, wildcard, and temporary filters. This exercise can be little rewarding and often tricky. It is well known that some OPECs cannot be searched in the field related to copy-specific information. And sadly, there's no May for 16th century books. With those, um, with those catalogs, with those online catalogs allowing this search, it is still necessary to make various attempts before giving up. 
Librarians can be very inventive when it comes to, catalog to, to cataloging blue paper, mainly due to the precarious condition of this material, which discolors with light, turn into gray, and browns with damp. In English speaking, in English speaking countries, they can go, like librarians, can only go as far as to record the paper color as gray instead of blue. But variants grow in number in French and German catalogues, while Italy probably leads the way, negatively, with its multiple options to describe similar hues, turning the traditional term carta azzurra into carta azzurrata, azzurrina, <laughs> celeste, turchina, cerulea, blu, bluastra, grigia, grigina. <laughs> Several copies can be discovered in such a way, so interrogating the catalog with all these variants. It's true. Um, provided one is prepared to spend most of his time skimming through results <laughs> pertaining to books with edges painted blue or blue paper elements in its binding. The second strategy is to go systematically through catalogues of the output of prominent Renaissance printers and repertoires of collectible books addressing bibliophiles. So the same kind of literature that Christina mentioned uh, earlier. So historical uh, bibliographical um, sources of reference. Starting from the bibliographical masterpieces written by Renoir, Camerini, Bongi, Wout, Dupont, Brunet, Peignot, Gress, and Ebert. All of them record exceptional copies and often provide their location in private and institutional libraries at the time of the work's publication, or the price, the, re the price that these copies reached at contemporary auctions. So as a uh, real, as a, as a veritable mines of, of information. However, online catalogues and historical bibliographical literature supply information which represent in various way, two ends of the same stick. Bridging the temporal gaps is essential and can only be achieved by employing a third strategy, namely exploiting antiquarian sale catalogues. This crucial group of sources not only provides unrivaled insights into the collecting history of blue paper books and other um, sought after categories, but may also record lost and currently untraceable copies. The distinctive feature of blue paper rules out the possibility of um, catalogers' mistakes, which is always there, any catalog, especially with sale catalogs. Though some forgeries have been produced since the late 17th century, either by dyeing copies originally printed on common paper or by republishing facsimiles on blue paper. Taking advantage of copies of sale uh, catalogs of copies of sale catalogues marked up with prices and purchases in combination with relevant collectors' libraries catalog and material evidence on copies enable us to chase a copy jumping from an owner to another, from a catalog to another. I would like to conclude with uh, an abridged version of a case studies of a case study involving Guillaume Filandre uh, commentaries on Vitruvius printed in Rome by Giovanni Andrea Dossena in 1544. Here's the title page. Um, I apologize for the quality of, of, of the pictures from now on. Um, uh, here's the title page uh, from the copy on common paper, as you can see, and with uh, defect, um, held at the Estense Library in Modena. In going through major British sale catalogues, I detected two seemingly different blue paper copies of this edition. The first recorded in Matteo Pinelli's library in the 1789 sale catalog as bound in a French binding with gilt edges. The second in the original Venetian Morocco lettered on the sides, which I suppose are the edges, offered by James Bond in 1836 in this very exciting and curious old dime catalogue printed on blue paper. So this is a sale catalogue printed on blue paper, mentioning, of course, several copies on blue paper. Um, the generic description of the copy 
appearing in uh, Butler's sales in the 1840s, so another record, may refer to either of them, but most likely to Pinelli's copy. We are aware that a few prominent English collectors bought extensively at Butler's sale and from Bond's special catalogues, including Prince Augustus Frederick, Duke of Sussex, and Thomas Grenville. With this in mind, I promptly checked the BL online catalog, but the three resulting holdings um, are presented as normal copies. Yet, shelf marks C30C7 and G9123 sounds promising, especially the second one, the G uh, shelf mark is typical, is, is the special shelf, shelf mark for Grenville collection, while the other is related to the King's Library or special copies as you know. <laughs> um, when I called for the two items, uh, for doubt's sake, I was pleasantly surprised to find, side by side, the two blue paper copies of this edition described in sale catalogues. One from um, the Biblioteca Saxexiana. This is the book plate. This is the um, edges lettered. And uh, this is the uh, blue paper title page. It's always difficult to um, take pictures of blue paper because um, the hue is, is always um, not, not as bright as it, it is in reality. And the other copy coming from Granville's bequest. So this is what um, has been described as a, a French style um, binding in Pinelli's library. Gilt edges, Gofford actually. Thomas Grenville, uh, um, horribly pictured um, um, book plate, and again, uh, the title page. So a combined methodological approach, mainly based on the painstaking, painstaking study of antiquarian say catalog, is what allowed their correct identification and also helped me to discover present location. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was very, very interesting. Uh, questions? Um, is there a time, what is the last edition that Aldous that is known of prints on parchment? And is there an overlap between parchment and uh, large paper or, you know, is he trying to go in a direction? Is there a gap period when he stops printing? You know, what can, how can you put these things together? Thank you, Jerry, for your question. Um, indeed, this is the first hypothesis that, uh, that, I, that I laid down, is that um, parchment and um, uh, blue paper and royal size paper were somehow connected, even in um, temporary speaking. Um, but it's not exactly the case. Um, sadly, uh, the I don't honestly know the last uh, if 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 it, it is the last copy printed on uh, on vellum. But um, I recall an edition printed by Aldous the Younger in uh, the 1570s. But um, for sure, if you um, sadly we don't have this this sort of uh, statis statistics, but um, the number of of parchment copies. Um, I think for the Aldine Press and also for other um, printers in Italy from the 1550s dropped. Um, and um, so it, it is probably connected uh, with the, 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 the costs getting higher and higher and the availability of other support to create the same principle. Um, although the quality, of course, it wasn't wasn't exactly the same, because the, the royal size paper was just just a trick. <laughs> There's no difference in terms of quality, and with blue paper is actually for um, ninety percent of the excellent copy. The quality is worse than than a common copy. Thank you. It, it, it is very interesting. What, I mean, I, it's something I don't quite understand the way in which blue paper in the sixteenth century is. A luxury is marketed as a luxury object, albeit possibly a slightly cheaper form of luxury than others. 
Whereas by the 18th century, certainly in England, but I think in many other places as well, it's associated with the cheaper end of the market in general because, of, because it helps disguise the faults in the, in the paper and uh, uneven colouring and so on. But I don't know what happens in between. And I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts sure. on that. Well, um, I think Aldous was the culprit and uh, the quality of the paper remains always the same, pretty much. Um, when Aldous introduced um, this new, well, blue paper was already produced, of course, so he, he, he invented it uh, for, uh, he transferred it to the printing world, to the world of, of printed books, uh, inventing books printed on blue paper. Uh, he did, um, apparently, for what, for the for the for what we know, um, he did um, commission a special um, um, realm of high quality paper um, dyed blue. So uh, and indeed, the the the, the first Aldine uh, copies on blue paper are of a rather exceptional quality, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, I would say most, if not most of the other, if not all, that are printed on common blue paper. And, and in the other problem of um, a material approach, like the one studying, for instance, um, watermarks, because we know very little about the, the production. We know how it was produced, but we don't know where it was produced, assumingly on the Gaza Lake. Um, but the, uh, the problem is that it's very hard um, to uh, detect uh, chain and uh, chain lines, and of course watermarks, uh, because the, the original part was so um, of a, such a poor quality that um, it's impossible to see through, and, and then the dyeing uh, create the sort of like horrible blue spots. So um, it, it is very hard to um, to to see through it. Uh, but again, the, the, the great number and the fact that Ariostus and Petrarch were the main, um, the main um, authors that, have, uh, that were printed on blue paper suggested that we are not talking about donation copies, obviously because Pen Petrarch couldn't <laughs> was, a, was long uh, dead by, by then, and, and Ariostus as well. And, and, and for sure it wasn't uh, something so special if Jolito, as he did, uh, publish in the same year for uh, different editions um, several copies on blue paper and um, and he did it with his numerous Petrarch and Ariosto editions which were like uh, just one after the other so um, that uh, I think is a, is a striking evidence of the fact that they were um, uh, saleable and Jolito is the only printer for which uh, thanks to um, uh, to um, Angela Morvo's um, studies and and uh, and uh, Christian Coppens that I spotted, <laughs> um, we know that uh, from his inventories he kept um, a, a relatively small um, um, number of realms on blue paper ready for 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 printing. But the comparison, sorry, <laughs> the comparison between the number of of uh, blue paper realm and uh, white copies, white white paper realm is like one to ten or even even higher. For just ordinary writing of letters in the same period, and can could that be the origin of of the idea of, of also publishing? Um, not not as far as I know. Uh, we have evidence of um, blue paper use um, in books for um, um, 15th century bindings. I spotted um, a few of them by chance in um, early Roman, um, early Renaissance uh, archival material in Rome uh, used to um, um, protect some like uh, books of, of, the n of, of the notary of the day. Uh, but we don't really have letters um, wrote. Oh, I, I don't think we have instance, instances of, of text handwritten on, on blue paper in... Not well preserved. 
yeah, yeah, well, yeah, of course, of course. Everything is open to, to um, <laughs> new discoveries and, and uh, um, these proofs. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, you would expect that. You would expect that probably. But um, I suspect that the the color of of the ink, uh, which wasn't um, enough, um, a, a, as black, let's say, let's put it like that, as black as the, as the printing, um, as the printing ink, um, would be uh, would allow for um, for using blue paper uh, while while you were writing. And also the problem is that as soon as the paper get moistured, the, the, the ink would spread. This happened um, even if you look at uh, copies in terms of conservation, you'd see that um, even the text block tends to um, become um, to brown and letters tends to, um, to um, lose um, brightness over time and so Probably this is the reason, I would say. Last, yeah. last question. In fact, the only example that I know of actually is printed on green paper, which is <coughs> not actually clearer. This is a napkin and not a wood block. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Green paper was, were, um, was more common in um, Germany, um, generally speaking. Um, and, uh, and there are etchings, later etchings, uh, printed on, on blue paper in the Netherlands uh, because um, Dutch were able to, to find a new way to um, um, be, yeah, a new, a new colorant and a, and a new mordant to have a better, a better quality. So Goldsius, for instance, did this publish a lot of, of, of um, intaglio printing on, on blue paper, but later from the 70s on of the, of the Cinquecento. Well, thank, thank you very much, Paolo. You've clearly sparked a whole <laughs> new line of research in the audience. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.